Hi everybody, Matt Brown here. Uh, this is 19th and 20th century philosophy. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit in this sort of intermission video um, about uh, the sort of bigger picture of, of what's going on um, with, these, with these thinkers that we've been talking about. If you're like me, um, you might be getting a little frustrated uh, with sort of reading all of these different figures writing in these different and sometimes very difficult styles. And um, uh, you might want to know, well, how does all this fit together? Um, and that's what I want to reflect on a little bit here today. One of the things that we've talked about before, but I think is worth emphasizing here, is that um, the field of philosophy, as it moves through the periods we're looking at, um, is really professionalizing right, is really starting to try to distinguish and demarcate itself from other kinds of intellectual pursuits um, as, part of its, as part of its identity within, you know, universities and the scholarly world. Um, you think back to some of the earliest readings that we had, Mill, Marx, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, um, we're talking about figures, um, most of whom are not trained Formally in philosophy, Marx was, but um, the rest weren't really. Um, we're looking at figures who are not working, uh, for the most part, in an academic scholarly setting. And, uh, you know, a lot of their concerns are not particularly um, abstract uh, in nature, right? They're thinking about um, how we live, how we govern way we sort of authentically experience the world. Um, as we start to move into uh, thinkers like Frege and Husserl, we get more technical uh, kind of accounts of um, uh, uh, philosophy. We get more abstract concerns. And um, this is partly a feature of that professionalization. It's partly a feature of in particular for Frege and Husserl, their attempt to distinguish philosophy from psychology. Um, you know, a parallel movement, especially through the 19th century, is the professionalization of the sciences, right? Philosophy and science, um, at one point, were kind of indistinguishable. We talk about natural philosophy, um, and uh, that accounts for people like Newton, who we now think of as early physicists and people like Descartes, who we think of as metaphysicians and philosophers, um, they didn't make those distinctions, right? We've talked about that before. So you've got Frege and Husserl, proto-analytic, proto-continental philosophers, uh, working on sort of defining philosophy against psychology with their anti-psychologism, their anti-psychologistic arguments. Um, in the U.S., you have uh, pragmatism emerging in the late 19th century, right, with William James, Charles Peirce, Anna Cooper, Jane Addams, um, and uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of what the pragmatists are doing is uh, trying to think of, uh, trying, to, trying to come up with philosophical theories of, um, of belief, experience, truth, that respond on the one hand to um, sort of everyday needs of people, and on the other hand to um, sort of post-Darwinian understanding of the human being. Um, and, uh, you know, at the same time as you have this professionalization process going on, Right. Um, take take William James is a great example of this. Right. Trained as a um, as a medical doctor. Right. Uh, originally, he gets on in Harvard at Harvard um, uh, to teach physiology. Becomes interested in the new emerging psychology, and it's through his work on psychology that he becomes part of the philosophy department uh, at Harvard. Right. Uh, that he becomes affiliated with philosophy, but. You know, once he has made his sort of landmark uh, work in psychology and becomes more interested in uh, sort of traditional, what, what, what you might think of as traditional philosophical questions, um, uh, he sort of moves away from psychology. 
And, you know, James moving away from psychology uh, is, I think, consistent with what the philosophical world in the early in the early decades of the 20th century was up to. Um, so uh, at the same time, we have this sort of professionalization going on. We have other thinkers, such as the feminist philosopher Jane Addams um, and Emma Goldman, right, coming from slightly different perspectives, pragmatism and anarchism, but they're both working outside of uh, professional philosophy in, in the early decades of the 20th century. And that's in part because, you know, they're working for the liberation from oppression of uh, other members of their group who are excluded from uh, positions like university positions for the most part at this time. And there are a lot of other examples uh, from the time period of uh, women who are getting academic training um, but not able to receive a doctorate or getting a doctorate uh, abroad but not uh, being able to receive teaching positions. Anna Julia Cooper, uh, for example, couldn't get her uh, doctoral degree until later in life, um, and then only in France. And we'll see further examples of that. It wasn't just uh, it wasn't just women, um, but also people of color struggling against oppression at the opening uh, and and on into the 20th century, and doing philosophy, but really uh, working uh, outside of the discipline itself, right? And this is a problem that philosophy as a discipline still struggles struggles with. For example, in America, uh, women are are underrepresented. Um, people of color are vastly un underrepresented. Um, and there's been a lot of progress on this um, in recent decades, but there's a lot of work left to do. And uh, these historical legacy of um, oppression and exclusion is a big part of it. So let's think in terms of some um, questions or, or problems or agenda items uh, for philosophy as a field um, going forward from what we've read, right? So there's a question, what is philosophy, right? How do we distinguish philosophical questions from psychological questions? What is the relevance of psychology to philosophy? What is the relevance of science to philosophy? Um, are they totally separate or are they relevant to one another? Um, what is the relevance of philosophy to science and to psychology is another side of that coin. Um, how uh, are we going to integrate in members of these other groups into philosophy? How are we going to integrate their concerns, right? Um, how can philosophy be a tool of liberation, right? And the struggle against oppression. Um, these are these are just some of the questions uh, that uh, philosophers are addressing uh, through these texts. Will be addressing uh, further uh, through other texts um, that we're that we're reading that are coming up. Um, and uh, one of the things we'll see is um, that some of the different approaches to these questions um, come apart. Recommend different ways of doing philosophy. Um, and lead to different kinds of philosophical traditions. So all of the thinkers that we read after the break um, are university educated, usually at the doctoral level, with the exception of James Baldwin, um, who uh, did not go to university. Um, almost all of them, uh, except for Baldwin and Angela Davis, also were employed in academic uh, departments, uh, most of them philosophy departments. Um, and uh, this is going to have an influence on um, how they think, uh, the agenda that they set, the kinds of questions that they ask. Um, nevertheless, uh, we're looking at thinkers from a variety of traditions and sides of the different traditions that we're looking at. Um, so we'll, get, we'll see a wide variety of perspectives uh, going forward as well. well. Hopefully those thoughts help kind of pull the threads together a little bit for you based on what we've read and give you a sense of what to look for as we go forward in our reading. Um, 
I hope you all have had a, a good break and uh, I look forward to speaking with you soon about uh, John Dewey, who's our next, uh, who's our next thinker up. So um, I look forward to hearing what you think. Um, please, you know, make a note in the discord if this uh, brings up any thoughts for you or a comment on this video. Um, and I'll see you in class next week. Bye.